Hey guys, welcome to this video for Mr. Wilkins and Ms. Ptolemy's U.S. History class. With this one, we're going to be talking about American expansion and imperialism, how the U.S. is going to expand its borders uh, and actually become an international power and colonize a lot of territories in the Caribbean and even in Asia. So let's get started. So the United States during the late 1800s and early 1900s was not alone in trying to compete for global dominance to be a world power. By the late 1800s, several European countries and Japan had established colonies in places like Africa and in Asia. This was known as imperialism. Imperialism is a policy where stronger nations like England, Russia, Japan, the United States would extend economic, political, and military control over weaker nations. So by 1890 in the United States, manifest destiny was fulfilled. This meant that the United States borders went continuously from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans. So once the United States had achieved that, many Americans turned their sights on extending power and influence beyond those borders and expanding into other continents or even into other countries. So as you can see with this map of Africa, pretty much all of Africa had been divided up and a lot of countries like the French uh, in France, uh, Belgium, the Portuguese, Italian, the Spanish, Germany, the British had claimed places in Africa and colonized those areas. Meanwhile, in the United States, with this map from 1890, you see all of this land in pink and in gold, including Alaska in the lower left-hand corner here, uh, were part of the United States. So why? Why would the United States and these other countries want to expand beyond their borders? Well, first of all, they had a desire for military strength. And at this time period, new territories, particularly islands and countries that were on the ocean or by large bodies of water, they could be used for naval bases. And having a strong navy made you a dominant power. They also wanted new markets for goods. The United States wanted new customers uh, for everything that they sold. So Americans could produce something and then sell it to people in another country. Also, the United States could get resources to produce even more goods from those countries. Also, <clears throat> in the United States and in these other European countries, uh, there was a belief that their culture was superior to others. This was based on the idea known as social Darwinism. Uh, and this idea was that people in the other territories, these weaker territories, were inferior people. They had weaker cultures. And the superior cultures, like the Anglo-Saxons, Christianity, uh, was supposed to civilize these people. And this cartoon kind of illustrates that, where you see Uncle Sam, who represents the United States, as this stern teacher who's punishing these other countries that look like uh, disruptive students. One's in the back wearing a dunce Sun's cap, he's hitting others with a stick. Uh, so it's this idea that the American culture is superior and is trying to get these students, these other countries, in line. So with the United States, uh, we began expanding our borders uh, outside of, uh, of what we've studied so far, uh, beginning in 1867 when we purchased the Alaska Territory from Russia. That actually used to be part of Russia. Um, so there wasn't a lot up there, not a lot of people, but soon after the United States purchased it, gold was discovered. And so you have this gold rush to a place like Alaska. And in the years that followed, oil was discovered there. The trees, the forests that are up there, the timber became very valuable. And other valuable resources were founded, like natural gas. Um, so Alaska is uh, turned out to be a really smart purchase by the United States. And eventually it became a state, it became the 49th state in 1959. That same year, in 1867, the United States claimed the Midway Islands in the Pacific, basically as a naval station um, for ships that are sailing from the United States to Asia. Uh, there's also the issue with the Kingdom of Hawaii, the Kingdom of Hawaii that is way out in the Pacific. So U.S. businesses, missionaries, and the military had been there since the early 1800s. In fact, the military uh, built a naval base at a place called Pearl Harbor. You might remember, know of that if you know a lot about World War II history, but Pearl Harbor will come up again. Well, the United States became more and more involved in what was going on with the Kingdom of Hawaii. And eventually in the 1890s, they overthrew Queen Liliuokalani uh, when she moved to increase the voting rights of Native Hawaiians and limit the power of the United States over Hawaii. And uh, so she was overthrown, and eventually uh, Hawaii was annexed 
was added to the United States in 1898. And eventually, Hawaii became the 50th state in 1959. And here's a photo of Queen Liliuokalani, the one who wanted to give her people, the Native Hawaiians, more power and stood up to the American government. But then look at this cartoon and see the way she's portrayed here at, the, at this side of the sea, seesaw. Uh, notice how regal, how uh, formal, um, how serious she looks here. And in this cartoon, she's simply drawn as, as just this caricature, this hideous, uh, just looks terrible. And that's the way she was portrayed. Next, let's look at Cuba, or Cuba, which is only 90 miles south of Florida, very close to the United States. And the United States had long been interested in Cuba, which was controlled by Spain. But the Cubans were not happy about being controlled by Spain. And in fact, there had been several revolutions that attempted uh, to end Spanish control of the Cubans. Um, one of the most successful uh, was one that was led by this poet, this guy named Jose Martí. And he kind of coined the phrase, as did other revolutionaries, uh, Cuba Libre. Uh, and <clears throat> so in the late 1800s, this, the Cubans were actually very, being very successful in wearing down the Spanish with their revolutions. Um, so the Spanish fought back by using cruel tactics, burning down villages and placing the Cubans in concentration camps and other horrific things. And so the fact that they were doing these things grabbed a lot of headlines in the United States. And this led to yellow journalism. Uh, which is also basically you could call the fake news of the 19th century. What happened was newspapers would exaggerate details of what was going on in Cuba, not really because it was bad, but because they wanted to sell more copies. One incident involved a letter, the Delome letter, and this was a letter from the Spanish ambassador, Delome, the Spanish ambassador uh, to Cuba that mocked President McKinley, the President of the United States at the time, and this letter was leaked to newspapers, and Americans were outraged that the President of the United States was being insulted by the Spanish ambassador. Well, this and some other uh, pressures led to the United States sending a battleship, the USS Maine, to Havana's harbor. Havana is the biggest city, the capital of Cuba. And they sent this ship there to bring home Americans and also just to keep an eye on things and protect American property in Cuba. Now here's a cartoon, an image, some drawings. Since they couldn't print photographs back then in newspapers, they would do drawings. And here are a couple of drawings that you would have seen. And this is what one senator supposedly saw when he went to Proctor, known as starving children and adults and weak men and women. And here's another one that shows a woman being strip searched by the Spanish, which of course back then would have been considered even more degrading than it would be today if someone was to be strip searched. So these problems with Cuba are going to lead to war, or these problems with Spain in Cuba are going to lead to a war in 1898. On February 15, 1898, the USS Maine mysteriously blows up in Havana Harbor. Over 260 American sailors are killed, and the newspapers claim that it was blown up by the Spanish, although later investigations showed that it was probably blown up because of a leak within the ship that blew up all the ammunition and the coal supply. Well, didn't matter. Uh, remember the Maine was cried by those who wanted to retaliate to get revenge against Spain. And so on April 20th, the U.S. declares war against Spain. And by July, the U.S. had invaded and defeated Spanish forces in Cuba, in the Philippines, which was control controlled by Spain, Puerto Rico, and Guam, both of which were also controlled by Spain. It was a very short war, relatively speaking, still very deadly, but more soldiers died from disease uh, and malnutrition than from actual fighting. It was nicknamed, it was called a splendid little war by the Secretary of State, John Hay, at the time because of how short it actually was and the American victory. Now here's an illustration you would have seen back then of what it would have looked like when the Maine exploded, although it happened in the middle of the night. And here's what one of the newspapers said when the United States did declare war uh, in Cuba against Spain. So to end the war, the United States and Spain signed what is known as the Treaty of Paris in 1898, and Spain agreed to free Cuba to give Guam and Puerto Rico to the United States. They also agreed to sell the Philippines to the United States for $20 million. And here, people were going to start arguing about what, to, what should happen to the Philippines. Uh, some people, known as the Anti-Imperialist League, uh, opposed expansion of U.S. power over other countries. They said it was immoral, that it was undemocratic, it was unrepublic, and it did not reflect American values. But ultimately, the pro-annexation won, and the Treaty of Paris was ratified in early 1899, and the Philippines became, part, became a territory of the United States. 
So now the United States could officially be called an empire. And here in this political cartoon, you see Uncle Sam representing the United States. Here's a figure. This is a guy who is, this is President William McKinley. He was president at the time. And Uncle Sam is basically ordering from William McKinley, the president, different pieces of food, which are actually the islands. This is Cuba. This is Puerto Rico. This is the Philippines, the Virgin Islands, and things like that. Offering them up for America. So what happened to the Puerto Ricans and the Cubans? Um, because both islands were occupied by the U.S. military after the war. And with Puerto Rico, uh, today it is still part of the United States. And this began with the Forker Act in 1900, which established a civil government in Puerto Rico. And then some Supreme Court cases cleared up some other matters, too. They ruled that the Constitution does not automatically apply to residents of territories. And this angered many residents of Puerto Rico and other Americans, too. And eventually, Congress would extend citizenship and voting rights to Puerto Rico in 1917. So now, Puerto Ricans are American citizens, but they don't have the right to vote for president if they live in Puerto Rico. If they live on the mainland United States, they can vote for president. But if they stay in Puerto Rico, they can't. So there is still a lot of controversy about Puerto Rico's status to this day. Cuba, meanwhile, was recognized by the United States as an independent country because of something we passed called the Teller Amendment. However, the United States still had a lot of control over what went on in Cuba. And the Cuba's new constitution was forced to include something called the Platt Amendment. What this meant was that Cuba would not be able to make treaties with other countries without U.S. approval. The U.S. had the right to intervene in Cuba whenever thought necessary, so the U.S. could send soldiers into Cuba. Cuba could not go into debt, so they always had to pay their bills on time. And the U.S. could rent land for naval stations. And that's why, to this day, we still have a naval base in Cuba, even when we didn't have a good relationship with them. And that's the base known as Guantanamo Bay. Meanwhile, over in the Philippines, remember how we got the Philippines from Spain and annexed them? Well, that angered a lot of the Philippines, and they rebelled against American control under a guy named Emiliano Aguinaldo, and they were angry that the U.S. did not recognize the independence of the, European, uh, of the Philippines. And so this revolt started in early 1899, and for the next three years, this was a brutal war that resulted in over at least 20,000 Filipino deaths and 4,000 American deaths. Civilians were dragged into it too. They were forced by the American forces into internment camps where they lacked food, shelter, water, and medicine. And the U.S. gradually extended more rights and power to the Filipinos and their government, and eventually the Philippines would gain their independence on July 4th, 1946. Uh, but this was long after they had been promised their independence. Uh, and this is Emiliano Aguinaldo, who was actually educated in the United States, uh, who led the fight uh, for, the, for the rebellion to end. And here's a photo of some of the devastation that you saw in this war, where all these civilians, not soldiers, but civilians, are lying dead in this ditch, dead from, uh, they're either slaughtered or they died from disease, and they're now being buried. Well, let's take a look at another part of Asia, major part, China. Uh, the United States and European countries wanted control of the resources that China had to offer. So the United States pinned something known as the Open Door Policy in 1899, where the United States and European countries basically agreed to divide China's resources. So no one country would have a monopoly over what China had to offer. Of course, one key country was not involved in this decision, and that was China. Uh, and the Chinese resented this, especially a lot of Chinese uh, civilians. And in 1900, there was a revolt by some of the Chinese, known as the Boxers. And this was known as the Boxer Rebellion, uh, against imperialists. And this uh, rebellion was put down by a combined uh, European and U.S. military force. And so once this was put down, the U.S. continued to expand economic and military control over the region, along with these European countries. And here's a map where you can see with the red, the green, the yellow, the purple, uh, that those are European countries and the United States, uh, as well as Japan, exerting their influence over China. And here are the Philippines right here. You see how close the Philippines are to China and why many Americans wanted to hold on to the Philippines. Here's a political cartoon that demonstrates how the United States held the key to China and these other people who are representing European countries uh, as well as Asian countries, have to go through the United States to get access to China. Well, 
One of the most, one president who had a major impact on this movement was Theodore Roosevelt and his ideas about foreign policy were known as the big stick policy. So President Theodore Roosevelt loved and embraced the role of the United States as a world power. He had earlier advocated for expanding the Navy. He'd even fought in Cuba with the Rough Riders. And his idea was known as a big stick policy. You use peaceful means to try and get your way, but make it clear that you will use force if necessary to get what you want. Here's some examples. 1905, Roosevelt negotiated a treaty to end a war between Russia and Japan. This was known as the Treaty of Portsmouth, uh, which is a place in New Hampshire. And Roosevelt would eventually earn the Nobel Prize in 1906 because of this. Uh, but this leads to a dialogue, a conversation between the United States and Japan over trade and control in the Pacific. Then you have the Panama Canal in 1904, where the United States recognizes Panama's independence from Colombia and then immediately proceeds to build a canal across the isthmus that connects the Atlantic and Pacific. Roosevelt also would issue what was known as the Roosevelt Corollary. This was an addition to the Monroe Doctrine uh, that warned Europe to stay out of Latin America. Well, the Roosevelt Corollary asserted or stated that the United States would use force to protect economic interests in Latin America. After Roosevelt came President William Howard Taft, and Taft would continue a lot of the Roosevelt's policies and repeatedly send troops into Nicaragua and Cuba to you know, stabilize the situation, but basically make sure that they were doing what the Americans wanted. But Taft also supported what was known as dollar diplomacy, where the U.S. government would use money and guarantee loans made to foreign countries by American businesses, so a more peaceful means of creating a state relationship. So here's a cartoon. This is supposed to be President Theodore Roosevelt with his big stick, trying to keep everybody in line and make sure they're doing what the United States wants. With the Panama Canal, Panama is down here, and this is the Isthmus. This is what connects South America and Central and North America, and this is where the Panama Canal was built to connect the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans so that ships wouldn't have to go all the way around South America to get to the other side. Well, after Taft came Woodrow Wilson, and he applied something known as missionary diplomacy. What this meant was that the United States had a moral duty to not recognize any Latin American government that was oppressive, undemocratic, and hostile to the United States. One of those countries was Mexico. And Mexico had a lot of money in Me and The United States had a lot of money invested in Mexico in land and oil and railroads. But revolutions began starting in 1910, very bloody revolutions. that involved figures you may have heard of like Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. Um, and so the United States eventually is going to intervene and would actually send in the military several times and almost led to all-out war with Mexico. Um, but Woodrow Wilson asserted that the United States would intervene to protect its economic, social, and military interests in Latin America. Here's a photo of President Wilson, as he actually was. Uh, and here's a photo of him as a professor, again, like Uncle Sam being a stern teacher, and here he is lecturing countries like Mexico and Nicaragua, these Latin American countries that are symbolized by these sombreros. All right, thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to be talking about uh, progressivism and how Americans in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s were trying to make changes for the better.